The European regulatory framework for genetically modified crops is a fascinating topic, particularly when compared and contrasted with the situation in America. In the 1960s through the mid-1980s, U.S. regulation was generally stricter than European regulation. The Americans at this early time were worried about long-term cancer risk. Since the mid-1980s, the situation uh, is reversed in a way. European policies now resemble U.S. policies between the late 1960s and mid-1980s. The difference is that instead of cancer, there is a worry that these genetically modified crops will cause irreversible ecological damage. Flavor Saver, a tomato, was the first commercially grown genetically modified food to be licensed for human consumption. In May 1994, the US FDA determined that the Flavor Saver tomato with a long shelf life was, quote, as safe as tomatoes bred by conventional means. This decision set an important precedent. One, there was no need for comprehensive scientific review just because it was a GM crop. Two, there were no labeling requirements. And three, there was no cooperation with non-governmental organizations. 1990 marks a date when Europe was attempting to control the genetically modified organisms coming from outside the EU, particularly America. In 1990, the European Council, which sets the EU policy agenda, adopted Directive 90-220 EEC on the deliberate release of GMOs. It's now repealed, but it set a number of important precedents. The background is that American companies in particular were experimenting with GMO crops in Europe, particularly looking towards Eastern Europe as a place that perhaps would not have as much public engagement. But this directive adopted the precautionary principle. Before field tests of GMOs, the relevant company must submit an environmental risk assessment to the competent authority of the host country. There also must be an application made to each member state to market a GM product within that state. Each member state has the right to object to marketing within their borders. This gives the states a great amount of control. Under Article 16, any EU member state may provisionally restrict or prohibit the use and sale of a product if it has, quote, a justifiable reason that an approved product poses a risk to human health or the environment. Under the precautionary principle, it's possible for one country to oppose the application to sell genetically modified products. In 1994, a British company made an application to market genetically modified canola. Once the canola would enter the European food system, it would be difficult to understand where its final destination would be and if proper labeling was taking place. The British Advisory Committee on Releases to the Environment was empowered by the UK's transposition of the Deliberate Re Release Directive. They approved the marketing in April. In May, the UK Department of the Environment proposed EU-wide approval. This generated an immediate response from Denmark, Austria, and Norway, 
who opposed EU-wide marketing. Their research showed that there were problems with contamination and particularly labeling. The U.S. ships between 25 and 40 percent of its soybeans and soybean products to the EU. It is also used in more than half of all processed foods sent to the EU. Although the EU approved the import of genetically modified soybeans, the Trade Association Eurocommerce, along with European food retailers, demanded that the U.S. separate genetically modified from conventional soybean products. Unilever in Germany canceled its order for 650,000 metric tons of soybeans unless they could be guaranteed to contain no genetically modified soy. Public opinion in Europe was changing and it was ahead of EU legal structures. The aftermath of 1996. In December 1996, the European Parliament, in other words the legislative body, and the Council of Ministers provisionally agreed that novel foods would be labeled if there was any change in their characteristic or food property. Mixtures of genetically modified and conventional foods were not required to be separated. This is a very serious issue. The Novel Food Regulation, effective May 15, 1997, did not cover already approved foods, such as genetically modified soybeans or GM corn. A second directive, adopted on September 26, required the labeling of GM soybeans and corn as genetically modified a more demanding label than the earlier may contain labeling requirement of the 1997 regulation. In 1999, there was something of an awakening in America regarding the dangers of genetically modified crops. There was a Time Magazine poll in January 1999 where it was reported that 81 percent of those surveyed supported mandatory labeling of genetically modified foods. Consumers were not so much worried about the environment, they were worried about direct threats to their health. The concept was that if something is dangerous to an insect, it could also be dangerous to a mammal, specifically a human, so that insects that could be killed by eating a plant probably wouldn't be good for the consumer either. In May 1999, an issue of Nature, an article quoted a Cornell University study that showed that the use of genetically modified Bacillus thuringiensis corn could not only kill the pests that they were trying to target, such as the corn borer, a major problem particularly with corn that has to be presented to humans who won't buy corn that's been chewed by insects, BT corn would also pose a threat to monarch butterfly larvae. It poses a threat because the BT corn pollen can, can be quite vigorous. It can go beyond the bounds of a field and it can land on milkweed, the preferred food plant of the monarch butterfly. In response, Ralph Nader's public citizen questioned the safety of genetically modified foods and the Sierra Club, a venerable old organization devoted to the environment, announced a blanket opposition to GM foods on environmental grounds. This led to a number of ad campaigns directed against GM crops. Specifically, butterflies and bees were being threatened by GM crops.
we know that these creatures are already under threat from chemical pesticides. Now they are under threat from pollen and possible permanent genetic changes in their food species. In Europe, there was constant opposition to GM crops. In 1998, Mon 810, a BT maize that resists the European corn borer, was approved for commercial cultivation in Europe. Shortly after, the EU placed an essential moratorium from 1998 till 2004 on new approvals of GMOs pending new regulatory laws which were passed in 2003. The moratorium did not apply to previously approved crops, such as Mon 810. In 2006, the WTO, the World Trade Organization, concluded that the EU moratorium violated international trade rules. The EU now has the most stringent GMO regulations in the world. All GMOs are now considered new food and subject to an extensive case-by-case science-based food evaluation by the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. Directive 2001-18 provides for the advent of new GM techniques. In other words, the law envisions that there will be techniques in the future that would have to be controlled. Uh, some of these techniques might involve in vitro methods of directly modifying genomes. These techniques are covered by EU law within its processed-based approach, where the technique used decides if the regulation applies. In EU law, a GMO does not need to contain foreign DNA to qualify as a GMO, in other words, foreign to the species in question. The directive refers to, quote, an organism in which genetic material has been altered in a way that does not occur naturally by mating and or natural recombination. In other words, it's very clear. Industry claims that the detection methods will not be able to tell the difference between a new G genetically modified organism or new GMO and a traditionally bred product. That is true. However, the law specifically targets GMOs. The European Food Safety Authority is an agency of the European Union that provides independent scientific advice and communicates on existing and emerging risks associated with foods. The EFSA communicates to the public in an open and transparent way. There is a very good website, for instance. The Panel on Genetically Modified Organisms provides independent scientific advice on food and feed safety, feed for animals, environmental risk assessment, and molecular characterization and plant science. The EU as a central authority has at times conflicted uh, with the needs of member states. For example, in 2008, France argued that like maize, the BT11, MON810 was an environmental risk in that it would create resistant insects, not only resistant to the genetically modified crop, but also resistant to chemical pesticides. There are, in fact, only a few formulations of chemical pesticides that have been used over and over again over decades, and that, like antibiotics, there are a limited potential number of these formulations, and they're very expensive to develop, so that w once insects get uh, inoculated against these pesticides and these crops, it could potentially cause problems for many, many decades. However, no matter how eloquently France presented the information, the EFSA disagreed. 
in 2011, France's ban of MON 810 was declared unlawful by the European Court of Justice. But the French government continued to ban MON 810. Bulgaria steps into the breach in March 2010. Bulgaria imposed a complete commercial use or trial ban on GM crops. Although originally it was for five years, it was extended to be a permanent ban after widespread public protests. This shows quite clearly that the, Euro the European Union as an entity may think one thing, member states still have enough control so that they can think and do other things. In November 2017, the EFSA published new guidance for assessing under Regulation EC 1829-2003 risks from the, quote, unintended, adventitious, or technically unavoidable presence, unquote, in food and feed of a low level of genetically modified plant material for markets other than Europe. The presence at a low level is defined by the European Commission to be a maximum of 0.9% of genetically modified plant material per ingredient. The ingredient could be grain, flour, or syrup. This directly impacts some imported American foods, some American foods imported uh, into Europe. The vast majority of corn, soybeans, and sugar in the U.S. is produced from GM sources, or at least it, it's produced from sources where GM crops cannot be fully excluded. A combination of two or more genetic modifications within one plant is called a stack. This is not a new genetic no modification. Several existing genetic modifications are combined through conventional breeding techniques. The aim is to combine in one single plant several properties such as insect resistance and herbicide tolerance. In other words, uh, it would be something of a uh, non-feeding mechanism. The plant might not taste good. The plant might also uh, cause immediate death to insects. And it would be resistant to herbicides that would kill surrounding weeds. The EFSA adopted its first opinion on a GM plant containing stacked properties in June 2005. As of August 2016, the EFSA has adopted 28 opinions involving stacks. While most initial applications involved lower stacks with two or three genetic modifications, the EFSA now assesses the safety also of higher numbers of stacks, four, five, or six modifications combined in one plant. Changes to the European system. In 2014, a panel of experts set up by the UK Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council argued that a regulatory system based on the characteristics of a novel crop by whatever method it has been produced would provide a more effective and robust regulation than current EU processes, which consider new crop varieties differently depending on the method used to produce them. They said that new forms of genome editing allow targeting specific sites and making precise changes in the DNA of crops. In the future, it would be increasingly difficult, if not impossible, to tell which method has been used, either conventional breeding programs or genetic engineering, to produce a novel crop. This is no doubt true. There is, a, there is a great regulatory burden. However, there are real differences between genetic changes that happen in a laboratory, who, uh, who knows the final outcome, and genetic changes that take place more gradually with normal crop breeding methods. After about 2010, 
Europe started exerting more control at the border regarding products that contain GM elements. As of 2010, GMOs unapproved by the EC had been found twice and returned to their point of origin. One, in 2006, a shipment of non-commercial GM rice arrived in Rotterdam. In 2009, trace amounts of a GMO maize were found in a non-GM soy flour cargo. In contrast, the European Union has approved a number of imports of GM crops and organisms. As of September 2014, 49 GMO crops consisting of 8 GM cottons, 28 GM mazes, 3 GM oil seeds, 7 GM soybeans, 1 GM sugar beet, 1 GM bacterial biomass, and 1 GM yeast biomass have been authorized. Animal feed is an issue that doesn't attract nearly the emotional response as food for humans. However, it has to be said that if a GM crop targeted for animal feed is growing next to a, uh, a food crop designed for humans, there could be interchange of pollen and genetic material so that there might not be a bright line between two crops. Conclusion. In the U.S., GM crops are regulated under the coordinated framework consisting of distinct agencies like the USDA, the FDA, and the EPA. EU regulation is based on the precautionary principle and a process-based approach. In other words, how the potential organism was made. Most of the EFSA's work is undertaken in response to direct requests for scientific advice from the European Commission, the European Parliament, and EU member states. The EFSA also carries out scientific work on their own initiative, in particular to examine emerging issues and new hazards and to update assessment methods and approaches. Thank you for your time.